This is the second of two lectures from Chapter 13 on solutions. And this lecture will cover the various way that we calculate concentrations of solutes and solutions. So a general definition for concentration is it basically quantitates the amount of solute that is dissolved in a solvent. There's so Concentration can be calculated with a bunch of different units. The unit that is the most common in chemistry is molarity, and but we will also talk briefly about units of molality, mole fraction, and mass percentage. The majority of the solutions that chemists deal with are solids dissolved in liquids, but before I get into calculating concentrations for liquid solutions, I want to just mention um, the concentration, calculating concentration of gases, because they are unique, of course. Um, and so there is a formula developed um, by scientists with the last name of Henry, so it's called Henry's Law, which tells us that the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the pressure of that gas. Um, and KH is just a constant, a proportionality constant. It, of course, is called um, Henry's Law constant, and so you need to be given that. Um, but basically, solubility, probably most often that's in molarity. It's, you think of it as a concentration of the gas. Um, is directly related to the pressure that that gas exerts. Here's a typical example of a Henry's Law problem. What pressure of carbon dioxide is required to keep the carbon dioxide concentration in a bottle of soda at 0.12 molar? So now what you have to recognize is that for gases, concentration, when they say concentration, they're really saying solubility, right? Solubility is the maximum amount of solute that can be present. So when they're asking for gas concentration, um, solubility is the same thing. So if you want to go ahead and try to use Henry's Law, see if you can calculate this. Um, here is Henry's Law constant, and otherwise I will work it out for you on the next page. All right, so Henry's Law is pretty simple. Let me scooch that over. All right, so... We were given the concentration or solubility of CO2 is 0.12 molar. We were given Henry's Law constant. The units were molarity and, and atmosphere. So what you want to do if you work Henry's Law problem, you want to make sure that all the units match. In this case, we're solving for pressure. <clears throat> so the units of our final answer should be atmosphere. And so if you were to check the units, let's just, I probably should have included them, 0.12 molar divided by 0 0.034 molar per atmosphere. Okay, so the molarities cancel out and we end up with atmosphere. I think just, this is just a handy table to have, um, something you might want to download and save or actually even print out. Um, kind of a good study guide, but um, gives you the concentration units, um, then the formula, okay, and the units. As I mentioned earlier, molarity is by far the most common concentration unit that chemists use. So you might ask yourself, as I did at one point, well, if they love molarity, why, don't, why do we have to learn three or four other different units? One of the main reasons is, is that because molarity has volume in the formula, liters of solution, which is a volume, um, volume can change slightly, slightly with temperature. Um, even with a liquid, it, can, it's, it wouldn't be detectable to your eye but in most cases, but it can change significantly. And you don't want something like the concentration to change with temperature. So... The other concentration units that we have um, stay away from using volume in their formula. 
So one of them is mole fraction. The symbol for that is like a capital X or chi, if you're familiar with the name of the Greek symbols. And mole fraction, just like any fraction, is part over whole. So if you were asking for the mole fraction of substance A, for example, the moles of A in the numerator and the moles of everything else in that solution in the denominator. So we're going to spend most of our time talking about molarity. Um, the first thing I want you to do is make sure you absolutely make sure you understand the formula. Alrighty, so molarity, which first of all is designated with a capital M, make sure it's capital because if you were to use a little m, that means something else. It means molality, not molarity. Um, capital M, it is the moles of the solute in the numerator. One thing that students find very easy to lose track of is the denominator. So the denominator is liters of the entire solution. What do I mean when I say solution? That's the total volume of the solvent and all solutes together. So it's not just the volume of the solvent, it's the whole solution. That's an important difference. So if you were to make a solution with a certain molarity, <clears throat> You don't care the volume of solvent. You care about the total volume of solution. The type of glassware that is used to uh, make a molarity solution is a volumetric flask. That should be terminology you're familiar with. And volumetric flasks are hand-blown to very high precision level. This little line on the neck is etched with a degree of precision of 0.01 milliliter. So very precise. So read the question. I'm making a solution of sodium chloride and I tell you how many grams of sodium chloride and I give you the total volume of the solution. See if you can go ahead and calculate molarity. If you're totally lost and have no idea, um, go on to the next slide and um, I will explain. All right, so the first thing to do, I think, when you're solving any problem is to write the formula you're going to use. Remember that just showing the formula that you know what formula to use will often get you some partial credit. So the formula for molarity is moles of solute over liters of solution. How do we get our solute, first of all, sodium chloride? We have grams, not moles. How do we get from grams to moles? We divide by molar mass of sodium chloride. Okay, use your periodic table. When you are calculating with molar masses, make sure you have at least two digits to the right of the decimal for good precision. So you can easily calculate the moles of the solute, and then according to the formula, we need to divide that by liters of total, total solution. Be careful, because in this case, you were given milliliters, not liters. So you have to remember how to convert. So, and that's a conversion you should have memorized. So there are 1,000 milliliters in one liter, so the amount of liters we have is 0.768, and that gives us a molarity of 0.0835, and people say molar. The rest of the lecture is really going to be practicing conversions, um, and try to do as many on your own as you possibly can, and you probably want to write a, a summary note card or page um, just for formulas. So here's another sample problem. This one is for mole fraction. Um, 0.1 mole of sodium chloride, that's your solute, is dissolved in 100 grams of water, that is your solvent. What is the mole fraction of sodium chloride? Be careful. I will not deliberately trick you, but I have seen these problems where they ask you the mole fraction of the solvent instead of the solute. And whatever they're asking you for the mole fraction is what goes in the numerator, so just read carefully. 
So the mole fraction would be the moles of solute on top, which they were nice enough to give us. You don't even have to calculate. So 0 0.10 moles of sodium chloride divided by the total moles. Well, so in the denominator, we have 0 0.10 moles of sodium chloride. And you also have to include the moles of solvent. Well, we have it in grams. So you convert the grams of water to moles of water. When you do that, let's see, you get moles by dividing grams by the molar mass of water. We have 5.56 moles of water. And so the mole fraction of sodium chloride in the solution is 0.1 divided by, when you add 5.56 together with the moles of sodium chloride, which is 0.1. The total moles in the solution is 5.66. So the mole fraction of sodium chloride is 0.018. Any type of fraction, just like any type of percent, is unitless because you have the same units on the top and the bottom. Okay, So it's okay to express a fraction without units. Onward. Mass percent kind of similar to a fraction, except you multiply by 100. So it's the grams of the solute over the grams of the entire solution. Now remember, solution means solute plus solvent. Since it's percent and not just fraction, you have to multiply by 100. Here's a sample problem. You have 3 grams of sodium chloride and a in 150 grams of water. What is the mass percent? And by the way, mass percent is a handy thing to understand because almost all consumer products, the ingredients are typically in mass percents. So that's a good one to understand. So before you start solving this, and this, this seems very simple, but until you're told it or think it, it's easy to overlook. What does it mean, for example, if somebody says, oh, this 5% solute, what exactly does that mean? That means there are 5 grams of the solute and 100 grams of total solution. So anytime you work a percent by mass problem, it's good to rewrite whatever percent they give you in terms of the fraction and what it really means. Here is the problem worked out. You were given mass of solute, sodium chloride, and you were given mass of water. So all you need to remember to do is in the denominator, it's the mass of the entire solution. So you have to remember to add together the mass of the solute and the mass of the solvent. That's probably the most common mistake. Once you get that ratio, multiply the entire ratio by 100. And in this case, it's a 2% solution by mass. Molality is um, probably the units that trip people up the most. Um, just similar to molarity, molality has numerator that's moles of solute, but the denominator of molality is totally different. It is kilograms of solvent only. So, so far, this is the only unit that doesn't have the entire solution in the denominator, it has only the solvent. Let's look at a minute and compare the formula for molality to that for molarity. So the numerators are identical, and it's only the denominators that are different. Molarity has liters of the entire solution, molality only kilograms of solvent. Molality is commonly used in applications where the temperature reaches extremes, okay? So very high temperatures, very low temperatures, because remember, molarity has volume, and if you change temperature drastically, you're likely to change the volume, and therefore your concentration is going to appear to have changed if you're dealing with molarity at different temperatures. Here's a sample problem, but just like all the others, I would suggest putting the video on pause, seeing if you can work it out your own. 
these are what I consider very basic problems. The problems you would need to be able to work to get a C on the test. So they can get quite a bit more difficult. So it's important you master this level pretty quickly. So the question says, what is the molality? And, and read really carefully. A lot of times on a test and you're stressed out anyway, molality and molarity tend to look alike. So be careful with that. Prepare by dissolving 3 grams of sodium chloride in 150 grams of water. See if you can work that out your own. So remind yourself of the formula for molality. We can find moles of the solute, as always, by dividing by the molar mass. So we have moles of NaCl solute. And I just realized I need to use a different solute besides I use, I'm using sodium chloride for everything. And the denominator of molality is kilograms of solvent only. It's pretty easy, isn't it? So we have the um, amount of solvent in grams, 150 grams. We need kilograms for molarity. So again, that's a conversion you should be able to get to very easily. You should have this conversion committed to memory. All right, so that equals 0 0.150 kilograms. So then go ahead and calculate molality, and you get 0 0.342. It is a lower case M for molality. We have gone through all of the very basic calculations for the four concentration units that I'm going to hold you responsible for. So it is molarity, molality, mole fraction, and percent by mass. So I'm going to start branching out and talking about um, some other related concerns. Um, and one short type of free response question that you're likely to be asked is how do you prepare a certain concentration in molarity? Um, understanding the technique of preparing a molar solution is important to a chemist. And in this type of problem, you it would be a two-part problem. One, you would be expected to, to do a calculation. And two, you would be expected to write the steps involved, what glassware you would um, use and what um, lab, steps in the laboratory. So, for example, let's say you did a calculation and... Uh, let's say you want a one molar solution of sodium chloride. So first, you can't weigh out a mole, right? So for a chemist to prepare a solution, it needs to be in grams. We have balances that can tell us grams. So if you want one mole sodium chloride, how do you get grams? You multiply by the molar mass. So we need 58.44 grams of sodium chloride. So the first thing you need to do is you add, you weigh out that amount of sodium chloride, you add it, to a volumetric flask, what total volume do you want for a one molar solution? Remember, it's one mole divided by one liter. So get a one liter volumetric flask, add the sodium chloride to it, add some distilled water because chemists always use distilled water. Don't fill it all the way up. Typically, what we will do in the lab is you will fill it just roughly halfway up and shake it and invert it until all of the solute dissolves. And then and only then add the water very slowly and carefully until the meniscus of the solution lies on that etched line that tells you you have exactly one liter of total solution. Why do you fill it halfway and shake it and make sure all the sodium chloride dissolves? because that sodium chloride is going to take up space. It's gonna take up volume in the solution. And so if you automatically added all the water to begin with before it was dissolved all the way up here, once you dissolve the sodium chloride, this volume is gonna go up higher because the sodium chloride needs space. Now this problem, I need to insist that you turn the video off and give it a try. If you need to go back a slide and review what I said to go through to prepare a solution, then go back a slide. 
but write down, give this a try because you're likely to see this on the test, okay? And the next slide, I will um, go through the answer. All right, so as always, when you're asked to tell how you would prepare a certain molarity solution, it's two steps. Step one is do the calculation to figure out how many grams of the solute you need. So that's a regular molarity calculation. So I'm going to give you a little shortcut for molarity. Molarity, capital M, is moles of solute over liters of the entire solution. I always showed this to my students as kind of a crutch. I don't know if you've ever used the magic triangle, but you can... If you're comfortable with algebra and you can rearrange this equation to solve for, let's see, moles or liters, then ignore the triangle discussion. If you struggle with algebra at all or get stressed out with it, then you might want to look at this triangle. So all you have to remember when you create this triangle is to put moles on top. It does not matter whether molarity or liters is on the left or right. So... Whatever you are solving for, so let's say that you're solving for molarity. Whatever you're solving for, you cover up, and molarity equals what's left, which would be moles divided by liters. Let's try that for a different one. Oops. Let's say that instead of solving for molarity, you are solving for liters. Okay, so again, you cover up what you're solving for. So let's say we're solving for liters. And what's left is your formula. So that tells you that liters is moles divided by molarity. Anyway, just a little tip in case it helps you. So the first part of this would be a calculation. They, um, so what did they give you? They gave you the molarity and you always have to find grams because grams is what you weigh out in the lab. So how do you get from molarity to grams? Well, first you have to go to moles, right? And then to grams. So again, if we are solving for moles, you look at the magic triangle, you cross out what, what you're solving for and what that tells us is that moles equals molarity times liters. So we then multiply the molarity that was given us in the problem. We multiply it by the liters that was also given us in the problem. And that tells us that we need 0.25 moles of the solute. And now we need to convert the 2.25 moles to grams because grams is what the information you need to weigh out on the balance. So we need to calculate the molar mass of ammonium carbonate. It happens to be 96.09. And so then we find out that we need 24 grams of ammonium carbonate. That's half credit if you do this calculation. The other half of the problem, because it says tell how you would prepare, now you have to take the grams of solute that you calculated and describe the procedure. So as I mentioned a couple slides ago, the first thing is to mass out the grams of solute, electronic balance, place it into a volumetric flask. Now notice here they want 500 milliliters. So you need to reread re the problem, get the right size, the right volume of volumetric flask, and it has to be volumetric flask. Um, so now you, pay, you place the ammonium carbonate in the volumetric flask. You add distilled water to about the halfway point. Swirl until the solute is dissolved. And then add, carefully at this point, add more distilled water until the top, the bottom of the meniscus is on the 500 milliliter etch on the neck of the volumetric flask. 
Molarity is the only type of problem which I will ask you to describe the procedure for making because that's such a common procedure in the lab. So now we're going to move on to just doing some more calculations. Here is a percent by mass one, which they're actually quite easy, but they can trip students up pretty easily. So this one says, how many grams of this solute, sodium hydroxide, do you need to prepare 75 grams of 14%? That's a lot of words. So if you're like me, once you hit about half the sentence, you're lost what they're even asking. So I want to give you some tips that have helped me anyway when I'm solving problems. Like, I don't really know right away how to approach this, but I do know what 14% means. 14% or any percent means that there are 14 grams of the solute, which is NaOH, in 100 grams of the total solution. Okay, so I should have put aqueous in here. Yeah, most of these solutions are going to be in water. So when I say solution, I'm talking about the total grams of solute, which is sodium hydroxide, plus the grams of solvent total. So I'm going to show you what I think is a really easy way to work these out, and then I'm going to show you the way the textbook um, typically explains it. And you just pick the way you're most comfortable with or develop your own way. So this is how I would work this out. I would say, okay, the ratio of solute to total solution is 14 to 100. And, but instead of 100 grams of solution, this problem only wants to make 75 grams of solution. So to me, setting up a ratio, because you, it, in order to be 14%, you, this ratio has to stay the same, 14 over 100. So I would just set up this ratio and solve for x. So how do you, how do you solve for x? You multiply both sides by 75, right? So you end up with x equals 14 divided by 100 times 75. And that's it. x would give you the grams of sodium hydroxide. On the next slide, I'm going to show you how the textbook typically works these out. And it doesn't matter to me how you work them out as long as you show your work. So here's typically how the textbook would show you. Um, they write the formula out, which is good. Okay, per Formula for percent by mass, mass of solute over mass of the entire solution, times 100. And then they plug in what they know. Well, you know from the problem that you want it to be 14%. You're trying to solve for the mass of solute, and you're given the mass of the entire solution. So now you rearrange to solve for the unknown, which is mass of the solute. So now it's simply a matter of math. You want to get mass of the solute by itself. So the first thing I would do here is divide both sides by 100. Get rid of this. Okay. When you do so, you end up with 0 0.140 equals mass of the solute divided by 75. Now to solve for mass of solute, you multiply both sides by 75. So you end up with the same answer. Um, it's just whatever method appeals to your way of thinking. Now for the more difficult problem. So at this point, if you're feeling, if your head is swimming from calculations, you may want to take a break from the video and try to work some of those basic um, concentration problems out of the practice problems in the D2L folder because these are a little bit of a brain drain and you need to be kind of sharp. All right, so these are converting units. So if somebody decides to be particularly mean and they say, hmm, 
Here's the concentration in one particular unit, which in this case is percent by mass, but I want you to get it in molality. So that can be kind of overwhelming. So you really do have to be sharp and on your toes. So first of all, remember what is percent by mass mean? Okay, 3%, for example, means 3 grams of solute over 100 grams of total solution. Don't forget this 100, okay? Now let's look at the units and how we have to change them. So we're going from percent by mass, which is grams of solute over grams of solution. We're going to molality. This is, I always do this. What here? I'm going to molality. What are the units for molality? Moles of solute is on top, and kilograms of solvent is on bottom. So I treat these as two separate problems. I treat it as converting the numerator first and then converting the denominator. So the first thing you want to do is convert grams of solute to moles of solute. That's not hard to do. Remember, you get partial credit for free response. So again, step one is convert grams of solute to moles of solute. That's just dividing by molar mass. That's pretty easy. The second one, you've got to go from grams of the entire solution. So remember that solute plus solvent. And in molality, you only want kilograms of the solvent only. That's kind of tricky. So that's going to be the brain drain part. I'm going to give you just an idea here. In this problem, you can assume there's 100 grams of solution, right? As long as you also assume there are 3 grams of solute. That'll give you 3%. So if you assume you have 100 grams of solution, and we know that for a 3% solution, that means we have 3 grams of solute, that means that 97 grams of that original total 100 grams has to be solvent. So why am I separating out the solvent? Because molality is only solvent. Once you have the grams of solvent, you can convert it to kilograms. I have these labels wrong, okay? So this should be times 1,000 grams in the denominator and one kilogram in the numerator. There we go. So that would be 0 0.097 kilograms. Alrighty, let's work another one. So let's pretend that our solute is hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. So again, the first thing you have to do is go from grams to moles. Uh, you do that by dividing by the molar mass. And the trickier part is, let's see. Again, you can always, in a percent solution, it's easy to assume you have 100 grams of total solution. 3 grams of the solute, which means we had 97 grams of the solvent, which is water, which is 0 0.097 kilograms. So that means our molality of this 3% by mass solution is 0 0.91. Remember, it's a small lowercase m for molality. You may have to look at that problem a couple times to absorb it. Now, let's look at, let's say a problem asked you to change units from percent by mass to molarity, right? So as always, write the unit you're starting with. Percent by mass is grams of solute over grams of total solution. Molarity units are moles of solute over liters of entire solution. All right, so again, treat it like a two-step problem. Step one being converting grams to moles in the numerator, and step two, converting from grams of solution to liters of solution. Now, typically in a liquid solution, in order to convert from grams to liters, you need density, okay? So density, remember, is the units, most common units are grams per milliliter, which basically tells you the relationship between grams and milliliter. However, if you have 
aqueous solutions. The density of pure water is, hopefully you remember this, if not, you need to, is exactly one. That means that one gram of water is exactly equal to one milliliter of water. So in aqueous solutions, if they're dilute, a lot of times you can make the assumption that the density of the aqueous solution is one. But other times the problem will give you a particular density. Alrighty, so again, assuming that we have hydrogen peroxide, molar mass of that is 34.02, so the moles of hydrogen peroxide are 0 0.0882. If we assume that the density of this dilute solution is exactly 1, that means that 100 grams of the solution is the same thing as 100 milliliters. Again, that's assuming the density is 1. So because molarity has liters of solution in the denominator, if you're, work, if you're given milliliters, you need to convert it to liters. So 100 milliliters, okay, you need to know this conversion. There are 1,000 milliliters in one liter. So 100 milliliters is equal to 0.1 liter. So the molarity, there we go, I'm a messy lecture, is right there. So we've gone over converting from percent by mass to molality and percent by mass to molarity. Please don't get too discouraged if it kind of overwhelms you. That, that take quite a bit of practice to master those. And that's a calculation I expect my A and B students to do. Now here are some problems. Once you're semi-comfortable with these formulas, hopefully you've got the formulas written out or printed out in front of you or looking at the textbook, go ahead and see how you do in this, even if you kind of flop around a bit. So calculate the molality and the mole fraction. If your solute is, this is uh, ethanol, what we put in drinking alcohol, um, in a wine that has a concentration of 7.5 per mass. So what exactly are you doing? So your given information is 7.50 mass percent. What does that mean? It means there are 7.50 grams of ethanol in 100 grams of the entire solution. Okay, that's what 7.5% means. That's your given information. And in part A, they want you to find molality, which is moles of, C of ethanol over kilograms of H2O, okay? And in part B, well, there isn't part, oh yeah, there is part B. They want you to do mole fraction, which is moles of ethanol, okay, over total moles. So that would be the moles of ethanol and the moles of water. So definitely see if you can do this on your own, but I will sh work through it on the next slide. So here's what you need to do. Step one is converting the grams of ethanol you're given to moles of ethanol. This is converting percent by mass to molality. Step two is converting 100 grams of the entire solution to kilograms of only the solvent. So let's do the numerator first. 7.5 grams of ethanol. So, whoop, yeah, that's right. And you were given the molar mass of ethanol, which is 46.07 grams per mole. So that gives us that we have point one six moles of ethanol. All right. Step two, we have to go from grams of the total solution to only kilograms of water. 
So of that 100 grams of the entire solution, which is composed of both ethanol and water, we know that of that 100 grams, that seven point, only 7.5 grams is the solute. So that means that there have to be 92.5 grams of water in this solution. We need to have that in kilograms for molality. So divide by 1,000. And now we know that we have 0 0.0925 kilograms of water. And so when we take that ratio, which is change, here we go, um, 0.16 mole divided by 0 0.0925 kilograms, we get the molality of the solution, which is 1.76 molal. Now for part B, they're asking us to go from percent by mass, again, 7.5 grams of the ethanol and 100 grams of solution. And in this case, they're asking us to go to mole fraction. So we want to go to moles of ethanol over total moles of the solution, which would mean moles of the solute plus moles of the solvent. So we already calculated moles of ethanol for the part A of the problem. And moles of ethanol is 0.16. So the denominator in mole fraction, you want to do the moles of everything in the solution, which is a solute and a solvent. So we know moles of ethanol is 0.16, but now we need to know the moles of water that are present. Well, how much water do we have? We just found out on the previous slide the grams of water, which were 92.5. So if you have 92.5 grams of water and you want to know the, the number of moles that is, you divide by molar mass. So water is 18.02 grams per mole. And that tells us that we have 5.13 moles of water. So that has to be added to the moles of ethanol. And when you carry out that math, you find that the mole fraction of ethanol in this solution is 0 0.0307. Not very much ethanol, it's mostly water. And remember that mole fraction, like any fraction, does not have units. Just a reminder to familiarize yourself with what density is if you've gotten rusty on it. Density allows you to convert between mass, which is typical units of grams, and volume, which might either be whoops, liters or milliliters. So if you want to ever go between grams to milliliters or the other reverse way, you're going to need density as a conversion factor. So for example, let's say that you were talking about a 12% solution of sulfuric acid, that would be your solute, and you're asked for the molarity, and they give you the density. So they don't tell you to assume the density is one, which makes it easier, but they actually give you a density, which is slightly different from one. How do you do that? Well, you start off with 21, what is 12% mean?
So our mortal molarity. Um, the moles of the solute, here's the molar mass of H2SO4, so we have 0 0.122 moles of sulfuric acid. Now here's how you convert. We had 100 grams of entire solution. They told us the density is 1.080 grams per 1 milliliter. Make sure you match your units so they cancel out. Remember, you're trying to get from grams to volume. So that tells you that 100 grams in a total solution is equivalent to 92.6 milliliters. But in molarity, we need to have it in liters. So you need to conv convert from milliliters to liters. And that gives us a molarity of 0.132. Alrighty, here we go. Finally, this is a long lecture on the last section of this, which is called colligative properties. There are some calculations, but it's also quite a bit of concept. Um, all right, colligative property, very simply stated, any property of a solution that changes with the concentration of the solution. So imagine you made Kool-Aid you know, one container with one packet of Kool-Aid, another with two packets, another with three packets. What are some of the properties that would change? Um, you may say the shade of the, the not the not the wavelength of the color, but how dark it is. Um, you might notice that it's a little more thick or a little bit more viscous. Um, so any property that changes with concentration is called a colligative property. The colligative property that are most concerned about are vapor pressure, boiling point, freezing point, osmotic pressure. I'm going to leave out simply because this chapter has enough in it. <laughs> so the next few slides, the last few slides, are going to be going over vapor pressure, boiling point, and freezing. All right, just as a reminder, because vapor pressure is kind of hard to wrap your head around. The vapor pressure... Um, is equal to the pressure of gas particles that reside over the surface of a liquid. So even though a substance is a liquid under room temperature, at any point there are fewer of the molecules that escape into the gas phase. And the pressure these gas molecules exert is called vapor pressure. Obviously, I guess it's probably intuitive that as temperature goes up, vapor pressure goes up. And it's worth reminding you, I've seen it on the ACS final, um, the temperature at which vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure is the boiling point. Okay? So as you heat a sample up, that's a flame. <laughs> um, you're going to get more and more gas particles that escape the surface of the liquid, and the pressure is going to start going up. Well, when the pressure of those more and more gas molecules equals atmospheric pressure, which is pressing down, when these two upward and downward force equal each other, that is the boiling point. And so you also have to remember that Atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. So if you see a vapor pressure curve, what you do is you look for atmospheric pressure, see where it intersects with the vapor pressure line, and you will get the boiling point of a substance. So why am I going through all that? Okay, because vapor pressure is a colligative property. What does that mean? That means that if you have a pure solvent, there's a certain vapor pressure associated with it. If you dissolve a solute into that solvent, okay, the vapor pressure is going to go down. Okay? Vapor pressure of a solvent is lowered in the presence of a solute that's dissolved. So what I want you to think about is it's easy for the pure solvent molecules to escape into the gas phase. When you put a solute, which is typically a solid, it's a higher boiling thing, in there, it, it's kind of, think of it as trapping almost the solvent molecules. It's certainly, they're in the way, and they're making it harder for these solvent molecules to escape. Therefore, the vapor pressure goes down. There is a formula 
related with vapor pressure, and it's called Routh's Law. And what that tells you is that the pressure of a solution, okay, so the vapor pressure of a solution is directly proportional to the vapor pressure of the pure solvent, okay, which we know is higher, times the mole fraction of the solvent. Now, mole fraction problems are usually asking you for the mole fraction of the solute. So make a note that when you're dealing with Routes Law, it all has to do with the solvent. We're looking for the mole fraction of the solvent. Since fractions are always less than one, that means that the vapor pressure of the solution will always be lower than the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Here's a sample problem that you should try to work out on your own first. And kind of trigger in your head anytime a problem mentions vapor pressure, it's likely that you're going to use Routes Law. So let's just write that while we're reading the problem. So that says the vapor pressure of a mixture. Equals the mole fraction of the solvent times vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Okay. So this is just a distractor temperature. Okay. Here is the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. So that would be P solvent. What is the vapor pressure of the solution? So we're trying to solve for P solution. And they give you moles. So you have to calculate mole fraction. So it, remember, it's mole fraction of the solvent. What was the solvent? It was benzene. So mole fraction is 9.90. That's the solvent. The denominator is always adding together all of the moles. So there's a mole fraction. Let's go ahead and calculate and see what we get. All right. So we're solving for the vapor pressure of the solution. Mole fraction is 9.9 .9 divided by 9.9 .9 plus 0 0.1. And if you calculate that, you get it's 0.990, okay, times the vapor pressure of the pure solvent, which is 104. And so the vapor pressure of the mixture of the solution is 0.990 times 104, which is 103. Now, remember that the vapor pressure of the mixture of the solution should always be lower than the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. And in case it is, not a whole lot, but it's still lower. Now we're going to segue into boiling point. Boiling point is another colligative property. They are inversely related. Okay, So if you look at a container with a liquid in it, what is the relationship between vapor pressure and boiling point. As vapor pressure increases, what does that mean? That means there are more and more molecules in the gas phase. What does that say about the boiling point if vapor, if there are a lot of molecules in the gas phase? That means that the boiling point is low. Conversely, if you have a high boiling point, that means that it's hard for these molecules to escape and therefore vapor pressure will be low. So they are inversely related. And remember how to get boiling points. I've gone through this before, I'm going to go through it again because I see it on the ACS final. If you have a vapor pressure graph versus temperature, how do you find boiling point? You look for atmospheric pressure, so it's in, if vapor pressure is in atmosphere, you look for one. If it's in tor or millimeters of mercury, you look for 700 and, ooh, what did I just do? You look for seven, I don't know what I'm doing there. You look for 760, which is right here. Hmm. 
and then you draw the 700, oh, I, I see what I did, okay, um, follow the atmospheric pressure line until it intersects with the vapor pressure curve, drop down, and that'll tell you the boiling point of the substance, okay, so here are the boiling points of these. All right, so if we have a pure solvent, it's got a certain boiling point, a certain vapor pressure. If you add solute molecules, typically higher boiling solid particles, if you dissolve that in the pure solvent, it's going to not allow as many particles to escape into the gas phase. That, so just, we talked about it lowers vapor pressure. What does it do to boiling point? It increases boiling point. It makes it harder to boil. So what that's doing by adding a solute, it, it's kind of trapping that solvent molecules in there, making it harder for them to escape. So you end up having a higher boiling point. There is a formula you will need to be able to use for boiling point elevation, and that is the change in temperature for the boiling point, and there's a B there because there's also, we're going to be talking about freezing point, equals, now this little M is molality, okay? Moles of solute over kilograms of solvent times a boiling point constant, which you will be given, and an I factor, which we'll talk about in a few slides, called the Van Hoff. Basically, I is related to how many solute particles you have in a solution. So specifically, in some problems, you're going to have to determine what I is. And the only um, tricky part of that is if you have an ionic compound. Now, remember, ionic compounds are combined of a metal and a nonmetal. Okay, so if you have an ionic compound that dissolves in water, the first thing it's going to do is break apart into the cation and anion, which will be solvated by water. So you have to be able to count the number of cations and anions. So sodium chloride has one sodium, one chloride per um, unit. And so I is 2 because you have 1, 2 particles. Calcium nitrate, on the other hand, its cation is 1 calcium. But if you look at the subscript here, there are 2 nitrate groups. So you end up with 2 nitrate particles. So altogether, you have 1 calcium and 2 nitrate for a total of 3 ion particles. So I is 3 for calcium nitrate. Now... Covalent compounds don't have any ions. They don't break apart into anything when they dissolve in water. They stay intact as a single molecule. So for covalent compounds, I is always one. That is really important to remember. The freezing point is very similar to the effect. All right, very quickly, we talked about boiling point elevation. The effect on freezing point is very similar, except freezing point decreases. They go in opposite directions. I am so sorry this lecture is so long and we were so cramped for time that I shouldn't have shoved down your throat, right, but I'm getting tired of doing it too. <laughs> All right, so let's work some sample problems. The formula to calculate the change in the freezing point is essentially the same as boiling point elevation, except there is a freezing point constant, Kf, which is different than the boiling point constant. Both of them have to be given to you. So here's a so sample problem. Let's write the formula out, and then as we read the question, let's see if we can plug in what we know. So we're talking about freezing point, so the change in the temperature of the freezing point is equal to the freezing point constant times the molality times I. All right, so let's see what this tells us. Benzophenone freezes at 48.1, and so that is the solvent, because a solvent, you're, that's what freezes, that's what you're talking about as far as freezing. Um, 
solution, you add 1.05 grams of urea, so that is the solute. And you're using 30 grams of the solvent. All that so you can calculate molality. All right, the freezing point of the mixture of the solution is 42.4. So now we can calculate the change in temperature. It's an absolute value, okay? So 48.1 minus 42.4. So the change in temperature is 5.7 degrees. The KF value is what we're supposed to be solving for. They say assume I is 1. That's awesome. That means that we can just take I out of the equation. And we can calculate molality, right? We have what we need. That's moles of the solute. Okay, that's the urea. Divided by kilograms of the solvent, which is benzophenone. So let's go ahead and do the whole calculation. So to calculate the moles of the solute. All right. So the moles of solute is 1.05 grams of solute urea divided by its molar mass, which is 60.06 .06 grams per mole. Okay, that gives us moles of the solute. Um, we have 30 grams of the solvent. We need to convert grams to kilograms to get molality. So there are 1,000 grams in one kilogram. So we have 0 0.030 kilograms of the solvent, which is benzophenone. So that gives us 0.583 molal, little m, which is moles per kilogram. So you can write either little m or you can write out moles per kilogram. They're both perfectly acceptable. So let's go back to our formula. The formula originally as written is delta T equals mk. We're going to leave I out since I said it's 1. This problem is asking us to solve for k. So if we rearrange this formula to solve for k, we get that it, we have to divide both sides by molality. So we get that k is equal to delta T divided by molality. So that's how we get our answer. Delta T is 5.7 degrees. Molality is 0.583, so KF value for this, benzophenone, is 9.8. Let's do another one. So this problem is a little bit of twist on the one we just did, and this one you should definitely try on your own, right? So as always, write the formula down. Again, we're going to assume I is 1, so I'm just going to leave it off. And in this case, you're asked for the freezing point of the solution. So freezing point itself isn't in this formula. It's part of the delta T. Remember the delta T is the change in the freezing point? So you're going to have to solve for delta T first, and then in a second step, try to figure out freezing point. So see if you can do it yourself, and I will work it out on the next page. Alrighty, so as always, I start, I rewrite the formula, and I write what we know. So we're trying to solve for delta T to begin with, the change in temperature, because we have to find the new boiling point. We're given KF, we're told the I is 1, so I left it out, and we're given enough information to solve for molality, so let's do that first. Molality is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. So in order to get moles of the solute, I have to take the grams that are given us divided by the molar mass. That'll give us moles. Kilograms, they gave us grams of solute. They said it was 32 grams. If you convert that to kilograms, we have 0 0.032 kilograms. So molality then is oops, 0.60 okay, mol molal. So now we can go and plug that in, 0.60, 
and solve for the change in temperature. And that tells us that the change in temperature is 5.88 degrees. So that's, you're not done, okay? So the, go back and reread the question always. The change in temperature is 5.88. Now, the original temperature was 48.1, okay? You know that when you f add a solute, the freezing point goes lower, gets depressed, okay? And how much does it change by? It changes by 5.88. Okay, that's what we just solved for delta T. Okay, so that means it gets lowered to what? That means it gets lowered to about 42 degrees. Okay, so that is your answer. The Van Hoff factor I is important enough that I just want to wrap up with a little bit of reminder because you're likely to see one or two multiple choice questions just about Van Hoff. So I mentioned that sugar is covalent, so the formula is C6H12O6. Remember, covalent, there are no metals. Uh, that's how you tell they're covalent. Covalents have no ions. They don't break apart in solution, so I is always one Ionic compounds, you must be able to break them apart into how many cations and how many anions there are to determine I. I've already discussed uh, sodium chloride. Okay, One cation plus one anion is a total of two particles, two ions, so I is two. Magnesium bromide. Okay, There is one magnesium cation. And there are two bromides. So you get two of the bromide anions for a total of three ions or three particles. So I is three. So how many particles would aluminum hydroxide, what's the I factor for aluminum hydroxide? Can you figure that out? Let's put this on pause a minute, see if you can figure that out. So let's see, that would break apart into the cation, which is always the metal, and there's only one aluminum, okay? So there's one particle there. We have three of the hydroxides. Okay, so one plus three. So the I factor for aluminum hydroxide is four. So the higher I is, how does that affect freezing point depression or boiling point elevation. As I goes up, you get a larger and larger change in the freezing point or boiling point. So if you're going to salt a road so that you don't get ice, would you rather use sodium chloride table salt or what they call rock salt, calcium chloride? turns out that to salt the roads, they do use calcium chloride because the I factor for calcium chloride is three. The I factor for table salt is only two. So you get a lot more bang for your buck with rock salt. And that's what the roads are salted with. All right. So here is another typical, I would say somewhat higher level multiple choice question where you have to understand I, the Van Hoff factor. So if you have any idea how to approach this, put the video on pause and give it a shot, and then I will explain it to you. All right, so to have the highest boiling point, you want to have, let's see, a higher molality, right? Because look at... Look at the formula. Okay, so the higher the molality is, the more you change the boiling point or freezing point, and the higher I is, the more you change it. So you want a high M molality and a high I. So you basically are going to multiply the um, 
m factor by the i factor because k is not going to change. k is a constant depending on the solvent. It's not going to change. So this first one would be 0.01 molality times the i factor for sodium hydroxide, which is 2. So that's going to be 0.02. Okay. Um, the second one, iron nitrate. Again, you have a molality of 0.01, but in this case, iron nitrate has an I factor of 4. So that multiplication, the total factor is going to be 0.04. Barium chloride, molality is 0.02. Barium chloride separates into three ions, so I is 3. So that gives us 0.06 for that third one. And the last one, urea is non-electrolyte means non-ionic, means it's covalent, which means I is 1. So just a tip for you, if you have a weird name like this instead of a formula, um, it's typically covalent. So we have 0.03 molality, and multiply it by I is 1, so that just gives us 0.03. So now if you're ranking these in order of increasing boiling point, you want the lowest boiling point first. That's the one that has been least affected by a solute, the one with the lowest factor. So that would be the first one. So sodium hydroxide solution would be the lowest. The one with the next lowest boiling point would be the 0.03, the urea. So this would be 2. The next one, 0.04, so the iron nitrate would be 3, and barium chloride would be 4. That is a very, very long lecture. I apologize again, but we're finally at the end.